So yes, I'm going to talk about um, competitiveness or, or willingness to compete or basically what, we, what I mean by that is individual preferences for or against competition. So a little bit like we look at people and we see whether they are risk-seeking or risk-averse in the same sense you could think about preferences for competition, right? That some people might be very attracted to competition or, or competitive situations, whereas others might be um, kind of more uh, averse to be in, in, in competitive environments. Um, so two things, so point one, uh, can everybody hear me in the back? Because I'm not, uh, okay, very good. And the second thing is, um, so so far we always had the questions at the end, so of course we can do that, but um, especially if you have clarifying questions, right? Please don't hesitate to interrupt me, but you, I'm, I'm very happy to be interrupted with, uh, with anything, yeah? so, so don't hesitate. Um, so my, my research on, on preferences uh, uh, for, for competition fits um, very much into kind of a, a, a still growing literature, right, in, in um, especially educational economics, but uh, also in labor economics, that looks at the importance of individual traits for uh, labor market uh, outcomes, education outcomes, and so on. Um, so if I say individual traits, um, that partially means um, personality traits as defined by uh, personality psychology, so things like grit, conscientiousness, the, the big five in general, right? So for example, um, James Heckman has done a lot of research on the importance of conscientiousness for uh, uh, success in, in, in education. Um, but we also have a, a literature that kind of looks at traits or preferences that are defined by economic theory, right? Where, where people look at whether people who are more or less risk averse or who have a uh, a longer or shorter time horizon, right, who, who discount the future to a greater or, or smaller <laughs> extent, um, make different decisions when it comes to their uh, own economic life. Um, so the trait I want to talk mainly about today, so competitiveness or, or willingness to compete, actually in a way it doesn't fit either of these two categories. So it's neither based on, on some kind of uh, long-standing economic theory, nor, nor does it uh, uh, directly come from traditional um, personality psychology, but it actually is just based on, on, on experimental results. And um, the paper that kind of started the literature on, on willingness to compete in, um, in experimental economics, uh, which is I think a paper that will be familiar to those of you who are experimental economists, but maybe not familiar to all of you who come from different fields, is a paper by Muriel Niedele and Lisa Westerlund in the Quarterly Journal of Economics uh, in 2007 that's called um, Do Women Shy Away from Competition? Do Men Compete Too Much? So that's the title of the, of the paper. And this paper uses a very simple um, experimental paradigm to um, get a, a very kind of say crude binary measure of whether somebody is willing to compete or not. And, and the game that they have people play in the lab works as follows. Um, people have to uh, perform a, uh, a task, so in their case that was um, adding up uh, five two-digit numbers. Um, and they, uh, people got five minutes to solve as many of these simple sums as, as possible. So in the first round, they were simply paid a piece rate for, for, for their performance, so they got one dollar for each sum that they could solve correctly in these five minutes. In the second round, people were put into a competition with three others that were in the lab at the same time. So these uh, people didn't know exactly with whom, but uh, um, they knew they were in competition with others. Um, and they would get four dollars per correct answer if they won this competition, if they were the best performer in their group, and nothing if not. So they were in each group of four, there was one winner who would get four times the piece rate um, compared to the uh, first treatment, right, or the first round, and three that would get nothing. And then a the crucial part is the third round where people can choose whether to compete or not. So people can choose between these two incentive schemes. So there are some additional treatments and additional kind of de design uh, details, but this is the main this is the main gist of it. And their research question that they were really interested in uh, in that first paper was um, do women compete less than men in, in this setting? And what they found is this, is this really big gender difference. Um, so I have a graph here from, from that I copied from their paper where um, you see the rate of or so the proportion of women and men who choose the competition conditional on how well they performed. So 
One means they were the best in their group of four, two means the second best, right? Fourth means the worst in their group of four. And what you see is that at each performance level, men were much more likely to pick the competitive option. And the difference is actually largest for the, for the, best, um, for the best performance. So these are the people who would have the highest expected payoff from choosing the competition. Yeah? Um, and this, uh, so this is one study, of course, but this has been replicated many times, and it's it's very robust, and especially in tasks that have some kind of uh, male stereotype attached. So, for example, in, in in mathematical numerical tasks, this is extremely robust. Um, so people, th this got a lot of attention. So this paper has been cited, I think, now thousands of times. And the reason, of course, why it got attention is not so much because we care about this little game in the lab, but because the extrapolation that was made immediately, and that's also the inspiration, of course, to, to, to ask this research question in the first place, is that um, if there are differences between men and women in how attracted or averse they are to competition, this could explain some of the patterns we see in labor markets, right? So in, in, in particular, um, so we see differences between men and women in, in the careers that they choose and um, at least anecdotally if you look at it what, what are the careers that are dominated by men very often they are perceived as competitive so thinking about things like sales is an extremely male dominated area investment banking finance in general and so on whereas we have a lot of areas that are dominated uh, by women, like uh, let's say nursing or, or, or primary school education, that are seen probably as, as, as areas where there's not a lot of interpersonal competition. Um, but so of course immediately or at some point the question has to be asked, like can we actually, actually extrapolate from the lab to the field? So can we extrapolate from this little game uh, in the lab to the field? So if we, if we want to kind of um, extrapolate these results and say yes, um, differences in, in preferences for or against competition can explain some of the differences we see between men and women in the labor market or maybe simply between different individuals in the labor market, right? Then we need to make two assumptions that we can actually test. And so the first assumption is that the gender difference in, in willingness to compete doesn't just occur in, in like little silly games in the lab, but is something that actually occurs in the field when stakes are higher and, and the situations are, are more natural. Right? And the second one is that not only are there these differences between men, men and women or between individuals in general in their willingness to compete, but willingness to compete is actually related to career choices. Right? So willingness to compete is some kind of like we could say a, a stable trait that people carry around with them that carries over between different situations and influences I important economic decisions such as what I study and, and what kind of professional career I, I enter. So um, I have done myself quite some work on, on, on both of these and um, so the, the roadmap for my talk today is kind of that I, I will summarize, I will mention different, different type of projects that, I, that I've worked on. Um, so first of all, I'm going to show um, a couple of projects, a couple of papers where we link experimental choices. So basically we have people, uh, in particular students, make, uh, uh, participate in, a, in an experiment that's very similar to the one that I just uh, described. And we follow up on them and we see um, some uh, educational decisions, some educational career decisions that they make, and we look at whether um, what they do in the lab right, correlates with, with, their, uh, with their career choices. Um, then I will also uh, mention some work um, where uh, we look at kind of naturally occurring situations that resemble the lab experiments, and we check whether these gender differences that people have found in the lab actually carry over to these field situations that are not set up by, by economists right, as, as, as experiments. And then uh, finally, um, the last part of my talk, I kind of want to get back to this idea of linking experimental choices or, or of measuring willingness to compete and, and kind of linking it to labor market and career outcomes um, to get back to some kind of very uh, kind of current work in progress that, that I'm really currently very actively uh, uh, working on, where we measure willingness to compete in different ways in, in large-scale survey data and link it to all kinds of uh, labor market outcomes.
All right. So the first um, project I would like to talk about is um, is a project that um, I worked on with uh, Muriel Niedele and, and my colleague Hessel Osterbeck at the University of Amsterdam, where um, we kind of just wanted, um, kind of for the first time, to check whether if we just run exactly this 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 needle Westerlund um, experiment that I described uh, a moment ago with um, high school students, uh, whether we will find that those who compete in this experiment make actually different choices. Right? And um, the setting that we used was um, Dutch high school students in um, at the academic level of high school. So to give you kind of an impression, so this is the kind of the 20% highest performing students. So at the age of 12 in the Netherlands, students are tracked into different uh, levels and uh, based on, on, on uh, their performance in primary school and some standardized tests that they do at the end of primary school. And we look at the top 20%, top 20, 25% of these. And the reason it's a nice uh, group to look at is because, uh, so they have six years of high school in this academic track. And in the middle of these six years, so after three years, they need to make a choice between four different, um, so they, in Dutch they call them profiles, so it's kind of different tracks where they specialize in different things. And this choice is, um, this choice is fairly gendered, so the boys on average make different choices than girls. And it's nice because it's actually uh, the first time in, in their kind of uh, educational career that they are making a choice. So, of course, you could say getting into the academic track is partially a choice, but it's mainly based on your, on your grades, right? So if you're good enough, your teacher is going to say, hey, go, go to this track, right? So it's the first time that they're actually asked, what do you want to specialize in, right? And um, so we do this experiment with around 400 students in, in four different schools in and around uh, Amsterdam. And um, the questions that we ask is point one, controlling for academic performance does your willingness to compete as, as measured in this experiment predict what kind of choice you make? And then second, can just statistically, just in a regression, if we control for it, can um, gender differences in willingness to compete explain some of the differences we see between the boys and the girls in the choices that they make uh, uh, in, in these profiles that they choose? So the four profiles um, that they can choose from is a, a, a science-oriented um, profile, a health-oriented uh, one, a social science-oriented one, and a humanities-oriented one. So the um, ordering I put here is not uh, coincidental. So that's um, point one, the ordering in kind of average grades of students that pick these. But it's also, and I think that's more important, so we ask the students to rate these profiles based on, on, on how prestigious they are, right? And how much money they think you will earn later in life. And all the students, so boys and girls, but also independently of which of these profile they profiles they eventually pick, they agree that this is the ordering, right? Both in terms of kind of prestige, so where do the smartest people go, but also in terms of future career prospects. Yeah? And uh, also importantly, these profiles are a very strong predictor of what people later do at university. So most of the people who later do a, a STEM field, enter STEM field at university, most of them choose this science-oriented nature and technology profile in, in high school, right? Whereas most of the people who um, choose something in humanities or social sciences also pick the humanities or social science uh, profiles at the, uh, uh, at the high school level. Right. So what we find is um, that what I just mentioned, right, that boys and girls, they rank these profiles the same. They have similar grades. Girls are actually slightly better, which is something that we often find in, in secondary school, right? They have similar math grades, so it's not the case that the boys do better in math. But we find these big choices that we also see in our data, but also in the national data, that boys are much more likely to pick the, the STEM-oriented profile and girls are much more likely to pick the uh, humanities-oriented profile. We also find the typical result that people have found in the lab that the boys are much more likely to pick the competitive option in our incentivized experiment. Right? So we also we paid them similar amounts that were paid in the original experiment. 
Um, but we, we conducted these experiments in, in the classrooms, not in the lab. So we, we went to the schools and we did it on pen and paper. Um, so we find is that roughly half of the boys pick a uh, competition, whereas only about a quarter of the girls pick the competitive option, right? And that's, and although they perform very similarly in the task. So we use the same task, adding up numbers, so there's no difference in, in how they perform. So what we're going to look at um, is whether these differences right, can explain any of the differences in the, in the track choices. So what you see here is, um, is a, what you see on this graph is a residuals from a regression where we regress this kind of binary choice of entering the competition or not on a range of control variables including how well somebody performed in the experiments, their grades in school, their, uh, so their actual and, and self-judged ability at math, their confidence in the task, right, about how well they think they did in the task, and some um, two different measures of risk, uh, risk preferences. Um, and then we show this residual separately for girls on the left and boys on the right, and for people who chose a different profile. So what you can see is that both, so first of all, you, you see again that even controlling for all these variables, right, boys are more likely to pick competition than, than our girls. So on the right, right, the, the bars are always higher on the right than on the left. But what you also see is for both genders, this clear ordering where uh, those who pick the STEM-oriented profile, nature and technology, they are much more likely to have picked the, um, the competitive option in the experiment compared to, uh, to people that picked, uh, the, that eventually uh, later on chose the uh, humanities oriented culture and society profile. Yeah? So kind of the ordering that the students gave us in terms of um, how prestigious and, and, and kind of money making these profiles are, right, is also at the same time we find the ordering of willingness to compete in, uh, of the people who enter these profiles. So this is, just a, this is just a graph. Of course, in the paper, we run all kinds of regressions with different control variables and so on. Yes? I'm not sure whether you mentioned that, but it might be that those fields kind of correspond to the competitiveness of the environment. So then it's not like this might be correlated to what you can earn, but then this would kind of show that it's not the earnings, but maybe just the competitiveness of the field, which is... Uh, ab absolutely, right. So, um, so there are two reasons, in, in a way, why a field might be seen as, or why competitive people might choose a certain field more often than non-competitive people. So one can be, it's just that the field itself is competitive, so if I don't like to compete, it's just not nice to be there. And there are actually, so there's lots of qualitative evidence from STEM fields that this is the case. So there's a lot of qualitative studies that ask people who drop out of STEM fields, which very often are women, like, why did you drop out? And then very often they, man they mention, so there's this super unpleasant competitive atmosphere in these fields, right? Um, and the other thing is simply that if I'm a competitive person, I probably want to do something where I can show others that I'm a winner, right? So how do I do that? Is I, I pick the most prestigious thing that I can uh, find, right? So I think both of these could be at play. Yeah. Yeah? But it might also be possible that it's not directly related, right? It might be just a different external variable causing both, for example, how much mm -hmm. I, I see myself in masculine terms, right? I see myself as a very masculine person, I'm more likely to compete, and I'm also more likely to have stereotypical masculine interests, which lead me to just feels, right? Mm -hmm. No, so, that, uh, so, so that's, that's absolutely possible, right? So we, um, I'll get back to that at the end of the talk when I, when I show you, but I don't think I can solve this completely, but where we have uh, data where we can control for many more other personality traits. But it's absolutely true, right? So your competitiveness, of course, in a way we capture everything that, that correlates with that, right? Net of a few things that we control for. So that's absolutely true, right? So it's, I would say it, it's kind of a... It, it supports the, the interpretation that competitiveness matters, but it doesn't fully prove it, right, in that sense, yeah. Is it you controlling for the absolute trait in math ability or for the relative to other fields? For example, it could be that men are good in mathematics but no other fields versus men are good in all kinds of fields. So we, didn't, so we control for both math and, and other grades. So in that sense, but we didn't control for the difference between the two. So that's a... 
which which I know that sort of, so I, I thought about this recently because there's a few papers now coming out that that say that right that much more than the absolute ability is actually the relative ability that matters, and then often boys are only good at math, so. <laughs> So in the end, they end up in, in STEM not because they're better than, than, than women, but because th they're relatively better, right? Because they suck at the other stuff. So, <laughs> so that was interesting. But we didn't, we didn't explicitly look at that then. Um, so anyway, so in the end, so we, when we run regressions, right, what we find is that um, uh, competitiveness, or controlling for competitiveness conditional on, on these controls, we can explain about 18% of, um, of, of this gender gap, in, in the, in, or gender gap, gender differences in the, in the choices that, that the students make, right? So the gender differences in, in, the, in, the, in the profiles that they choose that shrinks by about 18% if we control for it. Uh, risk attitudes also explain something. Confidence a bit less, so there are big differences in confidence between the boys and the girls, that doesn't explain that much. Risk attitudes explain quite a lot. Interestingly, the effect of the risk attitudes and of competitiveness seem to be fairly orthogonal. So, and so if we put both of them then together, they explain about a quarter of these differences. So of course, again, explaining here just means statistically explaining, right? But if, if, we, inter if, if we include these traits into a regression, right, the, the gender gap shrinks. And then also, and that I think is even more interesting, is just within each gender, right, what people choose is very strongly correlated to, um, to this binary competition choice, to the point where actually, if I want to know what somebody picks, and I can only choose one variable I want to know about the person, I'm actually better off asking whether they chose competition or not in the experiment, than to ask whether they are male or female. So the competition effect is stronger than the gender effect. So it's a very, so within each gender, right, the correlation is very, very strong. So this is one study, we had 400 kids, um, and it only covers the top of the ability distribution. So in uh, more recent work together with uh, Noemi Peter and uh, Stefan Wolter, uh, Noemi Peter is now at the University of Groningen and uh, Stefan Wolter is at the University of Bern, we uh, have a much bigger data set of secondary school students in Switzerland, so there we have 1,500 students. And these students are not only from this top academic track, which also exists in Switzerland, but they cover the whole ability distribution. So they're kind of from the students with the lowest grades, so in regular education, right? So we don't have people that drop out of regular education because of all kinds of issues, but within a regular education, we co cover all the different tracks of secondary school, right? From the people with the lowest grades to the people with the highest grades. And so first of all, we have a paper um, that's out in, in uh, AR papers and proceedings, where we just replicate the, the results I just showed you for the Dutch students, right? So we show that if we pick in Switzerland, the people in the academic track, and, and they make a very similar choice, so there they have seven different uh, uh, kind of uh, tracks that they can choose from, or profiles, but it, they're very similar, right? You have technology stuff, you have more art-oriented stuff. We find exactly the same thing, right? So those who are more willing to compete in the experiment, they're more likely to go for the kind of prestigious uh, uh, science-oriented tracks, and that explains some of the gender differences. However, what we can do with this data set is we can look at choices uh, along the rest of the ability distribution. So what does that mean is that we can look at the choice between going into academic education or uh, into uh, vocational education and um, in particular we can look at choices with outside of the academic field. So I think Germany is a bit similar to Switzerland in this regard but I think Switzerland is even more extreme that actually most people do not go into uh, uh, academic education. Most people do an apprenticeship or another vocational uh, oriented um, uh, educational path. Um, so what we see here is a histogram in our data of what the boys and girls choose. So they're about 15 years old when they have to make their career choice, 15, 16 years old. Um, so here on the right, we see the different academic tracks that they can pick, right? And we see that that's a minority of the students that go there, right? And on the left, we see different, so and I'll explain in a second how we group them, but here we see the vocational options and we see that many more students who go there. So it's very interesting to look not only at these people here, right, but also look at the majority of people here. And that's just because they're the majority is interesting to look at them, but it's also interesting to look at them 
because actually there are huge differences in expected salaries across the different vocational options, so at least in Switzerland. So you can follow apprenticeships where your expected salary will be much, much higher than somebody who goes to university and studies you know, something language oriented, let's say. And you can follow apprenticeships where your expected salary is very low, right? So you can, you can follow an apprenticeship as a lab technician in the pharmaceutical industry and you're easily going to earn 100,000 euros a year later on. You can follow an apprenticeship as a hairdresser and you're going to earn a fraction of that. Right? And the other thing is that, so we see here in the academic track, there are big differences between what the, what the boys and the girls pick. So boys, so generally girls are more likely to go into the academic track and then within the track boys are more likely to, to pick like physics and math, right, and girls are more likely to pick languages, but the gender differences are even bigger within the vocational track. And to have a bit of a similar ordering within the vocational track is in the academic track what we did is we ordered apprenticeships by the math content that they have. So there's an objective rating of that from, from like a, 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 um, a research uh, institute from the Swiss government, so it's not, we didn't come up with this classification. And, uh, but this correlates extremely highly with expected salaries. So the, the apprenticeships with the highest math content, they lead to much, much higher salaries later on than those with low math content. So one thing that truly shocked me in terms of the magnitude is that in the apprenticeship, so this is, the, is kind of one, third, one quarter of apprenticeships with the highest math content that lead to the highest incomes, we have 93% men. Right? Um, another interesting, and, and that's a very big one, that's why we took it apart, is the commerce apprenticeship, or in German, in Switzerland, it's called Kaufmännische Lehre. So this is like, pro prepares you for a lot of different jobs, but like, you know, accounting, human resource, like all kinds of, uh, 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 kind of commercial, commercial jobs, and it's also quite, uh, uh, quite good in terms of income, income prospects. Um, so just to show you that it's interesting to look at, at, at everybody, right? Not just at the academic uh, um, one. So we kind of, we do the same analysis, right, for, for choices outside of the academic track and for the choice between academic and vocational or, or uh, um, education. And um, so apart from replicating the results that yes, within the academic track it really matters, right? So competitiveness is very strongly correlated with what you choose. We find that that's also the case to a lesser extent, but still significantly so in the vocational realm. So for example, competitive girls are more likely to enter these extremely male-dominated uh, uh, math-oriented apprenticeships that lead to high salaries. And for boys, we find that they're they're, uh, if they're competitive, they are much more likely to enter this business-oriented commerce apprenticeship and especially within that to pick a track that, like, uh, that is more difficult and leads to, leads to high incomes later on. We also find that especially for girls, um, competing in the experiment predicts choosing academic, academic um, education over vocational education. So in general, we find that, um, that people who compete they tend to make more ambitious choices along the whole ability distribution. So it's true for those at the top, right? but it's also true for people at other parts of the, of the ability distribution. It's even true at the way bottom for people who are just on the verge of finding an apprenticeship or of doing kind of nothing at all. So for those people conditional on their grades, if you're at the bottom kind of of the grade distribution, if you're somebody who competes in the experiment, it's more likely that you'll manage to find an apprenticeship compared to kind of people with similar grades to you that, that, that didn't compete in the experiment. Right? Another interesting thing we can do with this data incidentally is to say, hey, so most of this literature that looks at gender differences in willingness to compete in particular in students, looks at people at the top of the ability distribution, right? Students at Harvard, students at the University of Pennsylvania, students at the University of Amsterdam, it's, it's often university students, it can be MBA students and so on. So the question is, is this gap, right, between the choices of men and women, is this, is this bigger or smaller at the top than the rest? So what we did is we just kind of put people into different groups uh, according to their grades, right, and which track of secondary schools they're in, in, uh, in into kind of in, into schools, into groups of academic ability. And what we find is that the, the gender difference in the choices in the experiment is actually biggest by far for the, for the most uh, talented students. So here we only put it into three groups. Um, if we do this more fine-grained with GPA, 
we find that this kind of continues. So by far the biggest difference is between boys and girls in the highest track of secondary school who have the highest grades. So there we, we find a massive difference. So almost all of, these, of the boys in that group choose the competitive option and, and uh, only a, a kind of still a minority of the, of the girls. And this is all controlling for, uh, for, for grades and performance in the experiment. Right? All right. Um, so, um, so this is research, right, linking choices in the experiment to outcomes uh, and choices later in life. So another interesting thing to ask, um, and I kind of want to briefly cover a uh, couple of projects that, that, I, that I worked on doing this, is, okay, we find this gender difference in the lab, does this occur out in the field um, when, when stakes are maybe higher or when the situation is more natural? So one project I, I did in the lab where we at the same time checked for differences between men and women in the lab, but then also immediately when to find a, a similar situation in the field is a paper I have with uh, Hua Ping Yuan where we look at uh, decisions to compete or not in a, in a more dynamic context. So the traditional lab experiment that I showed you before is that people make the decision to compete or not once. So what we were interested here is whether there's also differences, uh, whether there are also gender differences in how people react to winning and losing in competitions in a dynamic context. So if I choose to compete, then I win or I lose, I find out whether I won or I lost. Do I compete again or do I not compete again? Right? Um, so basically all we did in the lab is run instead of doing this experiment, this choice once, we just had people do the same choice uh, several times sequentially over several rounds and giving them feedback in between on whether they won the competition or not. <laughs> and then we can actually use this in a way as a randomized treatment because if you control for how well you performed in the task, then winning or losing is random, right? So if I got allocated to a good opponent, I lost. If I got allocated randomly to a weak opponent, I won, but I'm still the same person. Yeah? So what we find in the lab, um, so this is just two separate experiments, so this is just to show that it replicates when we do it twice. Uh, what you see here is that for people who chose in the first round to compete, right, separately for men and women, and whether they won in the first round or lost in the first round, what's the proportion of following rounds that they choose to compete? So not so surprisingly, people who compete in the first round and then win, they compete for most of the, of the following rounds, and that's true both for the women and for the men. The big difference occurs for people who compete in the first round and lose. In that case, for men who competed in the first round and lost, right, they still compete about half the time over the following rounds, whereas for the women that's uh, closer to about 20%. And we, do, we have two separate experiments where we do this and, and we find exactly the same, uh, the same result. So what we immediately ask is, is the, um, whether this kind of also carries over to the, to the field. So what we found is that uh, uh, it's, it's, a, it's a setting where we have quite similar attributes to this lab experiment, and that's the, uh, the Math Olympiad in the Netherlands. So why is that a nice setting to look at? It's because we need a setting where we have repeated competition, so people compete, decide to compete, then they find out whether they were successful or not, and then they decide whether to compete again. So the nice thing about the Dutch Math Olympiad is that, so on, on top of it, it's also a mathematical competition, like most of the, of the lab experiments, right? Um, is that students can partic participate repeatedly over the course of their, of their secondary school career, and many, many of them do. So, um, and every year there's a cutoff where people who pass the cutoff advance to a second round, which is what we kind of is our definition of being successful or winning the competition, or they kind of, they're not good enough, right, and they don't pass to the second round and they drop out of the competition. Um, and we look at students in, in year four of, of, of their secondary school, because year five is the last time they can participate, so a lot of the people who participate in year four participate again, but, but not all of them. And uh, so what we see is quite a few things that we also find in the lab. Um, so a majority of the, com of the competitors is, is male, so it's about a third uh, female, two-thirds male. Um, a lot of them participate again, but the boys are more likely to participate again the year after than the girls. Um, obviously, in this setting, it's not random whether you win or lose. Right? So in the lab, it's kind of random because I allocate you a random opponent. Here, there's a sharp cutoff. 
However, because there's a sharp ex post defined cutoff, we can, re we can use regression discontinuity analysis, right, to compare people just below and just above the cutoff, and then interact this regression discontinuity with gender to see whether the difference between boys just below and above the cutoff is smaller than the difference in, in, in the likelihood of participating again of girls just below and above the cutoff. So this is the regression discontinuity. So what you see is so blue is the, so zero here is the, is the cutoff, right? So these are the people who just made it to the second round and these are the people who just didn't make it. On the y-axis you have the likelihood of, of, uh, bo of uh, boys and girls in each of the groups um, to participate again one year one year later, so you see the likelihood is increasing in score, right? So these are, by the way, only people who score very close to the cutoff, so that the actual distribution is much, is much larger. So what you see is that for boys in blue, it doesn't really matter, right? So those just below and just above the cutoff are, are, very, are equally likely to participate again a year later, whereas for the girls you have a drop at the cutoff of about 10 percentage points, which compared to the, the base rate of participating again is about a 20-25% reduction in, in the likelihood of participating again, right, if you're just below versus just above the cutoff. And then we can, we can do this, so I just showed you now for a very narrow range, right, and then we can kind of check robustness by using more or less of the data left and right of the cutoff, but the result is always the same. For the boys on top, the estimates are always that it doesn't matter whether you made it or not. For the girls, it's always that you have a, a drop of between 10 and 20 percentage points, right, if, if you if you're just didn't make it compared to where you just made it, and then you, of course, that results in a, in a gender difference of the, of, of the effect. So this is just to show another way of, of kind of, so we have the lab results and then we try to take it to the, to the field in a similar setting and we find a, a, a similar result. Um, another approach um, that, so I have to say this is the first time I'm using this, another approach to kind of look at uh, do lab results translate to higher stake settings that many people have used in, in, in for other questions is to use data from game shows. So there's a big literature on, on uh, uh, risk, um, on, on risk preferences and, and choices on the risk using game show data because very often game shows actually are quite close to kind of lottery games that economists play in the lab but then using much higher stakes, right? So people have often looked at whether things like loss aversion carry over from the field into settings where it's about hundreds of thousands instead of about like, you know, five euros. Um, so I have ongoing work with uh, Martijn van den Assem and Denny van Dolder at the Free University of Amsterdam and they have this amazing data set of data from the Dutch version of Deal or No Deal. I mean some people might know the, the game so it's like, so many people have used this and including them so they have amassed this whole data set to study uh, decision making on the risk because the final game people have to make lots of risky decisions between kind of certain amounts or, or, su or suitcases that could have more or less money in them. So you have lots of risky decisions and the question is when do you stop, right? So how, how long do you keep risking it? Do you go for higher possible amounts or do you take the, the safe amount? However, in the Dutch version, I think this is not universal across the globe, but in the Dutch version of the show, um, there are some competitive games that select this person that gets to play this deal or no deal game. And the way that works is that actually participating in the show in the Netherlands is a prize that you can win by participating in the Dutch lottery. So it's actually in the Dutch postcode lottery, which is a very evil scheme uh, of the Dutch uh, lottery company, where instead of drawing numbers, you draw a postcode. And then if you draw the postcode, everybody in that postcode who participated in the lottery wins. So this has, the, I'm calling it evil because that means that if you don't play it, you know that you would have won had you played, right? So usually if you play the lottery, I don't play the lottery, I don't know if I would have won, right? But if all your neighbors suddenly, you know, drive a, a very expensive car, you, you know that you could have won, right? So there's actually a very nice paper by some Dutch economists where they show that neighbors of people who won but didn't participate themselves start spending more money on conspicuous consumption. So <laughs> it's, a, it's, a, it's, it's, a, it's an evil scheme, but one of the things you can win there is, is a ticket to participate in this show. And that's very attractive because they raffle off lots of different things on, on the people who sit in the show. And another thing they do is they ask some trivia questions where you have to estimate something. So for example, say the length of the River Nile. And the, closest the person who's closest to the true value out of the 
I think it's several hundred people in the audience, they get to choose whether they want to compete with, uh, with four others for, for the spot in this final game, where you can win on average 500,000 euros, or whether they want to opt out of this competition in uh, exchange for a comparatively small price, like for example a holiday worth like 5,000 euros. Yeah? So you can either, so you, you, the person who's closest on a, on a question, you get asked, like, do you want this holiday, right? <laughs> or do you want to go and compete with some others, probably leaving with nothing, but maybe playing this game where you can win up to a million euros, right? So, uh, and this is made by five people sequentially. So that means that if you're the first person, you don't know anything about your potential competitor, but if you're the second, third, fourth, or fifth, you have some idea about the gender composi composition of people that you would have to compete against if you don't opt out, right? So what we find there is that, um, so here you have opt-out rates. So these are people who pick the outside option instead of the competition. You see that women are more than twice as likely as men to, to opt out, right? To say, no, I, give, me this, give me the car, give me the, the holiday, I don't want to stay in the competition for a spot in the final. However, so this is on top, right? So that means like, okay, even under these very high stakes uh, with a completely different population, right? We, we find this gender difference. Um, but what we also find is that the gender difference really depends for the people who are not the first to choose, really depends on the gender composition of the competitor pool that's already there. Right? So if I'm, if I'm the second, third, fourth, or fifth person to choose, then if at least half, if more than half of the uh, uh, competitor pool is male, right, then women are about four times as likely as men to opt out. So in particular, it seems that women are likely to take the outside option when they know they would have to compete against men. The difference is not there in a situation where the competitor, competitor pool is predominantly female. Huh? So this is just to show that we can use some kind of naturally occurring data to check whether these lab results where the stakes are, you know, we're talking about oh, maybe I earn 20 euros or 10 euros, right here it's about 500,000 up to a million euros. And we find these, these differences. Um, how much time do I have? For talking? Yeah. Uh, it's up to you. I think we should stop around quarter two. Okay. So, um, okay. So, wh one more thing in this game show. There's also like so. Then you have these five people. They compete against each other, and then there's another competition with two people, where um, two people stand in front of a table. So the last two that are left, and they have a head-to-head -head competition for playing this final game. So e they stand at the table. Each of them has a buzzer in front of them. There's a clock, or it's not really a clock, it's an amount of money that keeps increasing. Nobody knows when it's going to stop. If you press the buzzer, you get that amount of money that's on the counter at that moment. If you don't press the buzzer, and the other one presses, then you're automatically in the final game. If nobody presses, there's a competition based on a trivia question, who gets in the, into the final. And there again we see, in particular in, in, in mixed sex pairings, that the men are much less likely to, to press this buzzer than, than are the women. So we also find this kind of at this, at this later stage in the, in the competition. All right, um, so for the last part of this talk, I would like to talk about some like super current work in progress research that I have uh, together with Muriel Needle and Hessel Osterbeek, with whom I already worked on the first study on the Dutch high school students. Um, so we did this study and um, we're not the only ones who did this, this research. So there are lots of people who have done similar research, right, on risk preferences, time preferences, and so on. But there are also other people who have done the same, same or similar research on willingness to compete, finding similar results. So this is kind of a growing, growing literature uh, with people having looked at uh, uh, kind of, for example, starting salaries and, and industry choice of MBA students. So that's the Reuben et al. paper. Uh, people have looked at investment decisions of entrepreneurs and so on. So this is kind of still growing literature. Um, there's also a couple of field experiments where um, people randomly offered uh, different uh, types of uh, incentive schemes to people who applied for jobs, finding that if you offer competitive bonuses, then it's more likely that, that men uh, keep their interest in a job than, than are women and, 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 and vice versa. So there is, there is a growing literature right, showing that at least correlationally 
uh, or in some, some, in some instances in these field experiments also causally, um, competitiveness matters for gender differences in the labor market and uh, also within each gender, right, individually, um, willingness to compete is a trait that is correlated with people's uh, career outcomes and career choices. So one limitation that uh, these studies have, including, uh, including my own work, is that um, we look at samples that are usually fairly small. So, you know, our study in Switzerland with 1,500 students, but compared to the amount of different choices that people can make, right, that's actually not so much. And uh, mainly we're able to look at short to medium term, <laughs> term outcomes. And, and these limitations are somewhat inherent to the uh, paradigm of using an incentivized choice experiment. Right? So it's very hard to get a representative sample of the working population of Germany uh, into a lab to do an incentivized experiment. Right? So it's, it's very hard and it's also very expensive. So you have inherent limitations to sample size, but you also have inherent limitations to the kind of population that you can reach. On top of it, usually this data cannot be linked to any kind of administrative records or, or, or survey data and, and, and so on. Right? Um, so in, in ongoing work, so our, our current title is, is Can Competitiveness Predict Education and Labor Market Outcomes? Evidence from both incentivized choice measures and survey measures. Um, we ask three questions. So the question number one is, if we actually do such an incentivized choice experiment, right, that we already looked at now several times, with a representative kind of sample of the Dutch population rather than selective student samples or like, you know, high school students, um, is what they do in, in the experiment, is that correlated with labor market outcomes? And here I'm talking just standard labor market outcomes, how much money do people earn, what kind of job do they have, are they managers or not, and so on. But then secondly, and that I think is the, is the big innovation of this, um, of this project, is can we find a questionnaire-based measure of willingness to compete, right? So can we do something that, say, is more associated with personality psychology than with economics? Can we just find a, a simple question that is equally predictive of the outcomes and that correlates with the incentivized measure, but that would then be much more easy to ask in future surveys, right? And also much more easy to ask in surveys where you cannot run incentivized experiments and to maybe ask in, in large scale international or national surveys. Yeah? And then, if we can find such a measure, right, how much does this measure matter compared to traits that economists and psychologists have traditionally been interested in? And we can ask this in two ways. We can say, hey, is, is this measure then more or less predictive of outcomes than, let's say, the big five personality traits, risk aversion, self-esteem, and so on? And if we control for all these other things, right, that we already have theories for and already have a literature for, does it still matter if I know somebody's competitiveness on top of all these other measures? Or is willingness to compete just a trait that is actually already well captured by a combination of these other traits that we already kind of know how to measure? Yeah? So what we do is we use um, the Dutch LIST panel. So this is an ongoing survey panel. It's a bit like the socioeconomic panel in, in, in Germany, let's say. Um, it's run by the University of Tilburg. And um, the nice part of this, of this panel is that, so it's been going on for a while, so we know a lot about these people. They answer these kind of core questionnaires about many things on a yearly basis. So we know a lot about their labor market characteristics, but we also know a lot of traditional uh, personality uh, uh, scales. So, you know, Big Five, Rosenberg self-esteem, stuff like that. that. That's kind of already in there. Um, and, and, researchers can apply and then mainly so the main criterion is that you have enough money can apply and pay money to introduce their own measures into this into this panel another nice feature of this panel is that uh, that's something that became available recently that we want to take advantage of in the future is that uh, it can anonymous, anonymously be linked to uh, dutch registry data through statistics netherlands so eventually you could even link what people answering these surveys to their tax returns or health records or, or whatever you want. All right. 
So what we did is um, in March 2017, we just came up with just the most simple question that we could think of, and that's very much inspired by uh, the work of Thomas Dorman and Armin Falk um, on, on, on risk preferences, and, and but now more recently also on social preferences, right? Where instead of just doing lots of complicated lottery choice experiments, they just asked people, you know, on a scale from zero to 10, how risk seeking are you? Right, where 10 is extremely risk seeking and, and 0 means I avoid all risks. Right? So we did something very similar and we just asked people on a scale from 0 to 10, you know, how, how do you see yourself? Um, are you not competitive at all or are you very competitive or somewhere, somewhere in between? And then, and that's a nice part of doing this on, on this ongoing survey panel, we waited a whole year during which these people answered lots of other questionnaires and participated in other experiments and so on. And after this full year, we took a quite large subsample, so 1,700 people, and ran an incentivized choice experiment, right? Along the lines that, that, that I explained before, where people choose between competitive and non-competitive incentives, right, for their performance in a, in, a, in a task. So what that means, right, is that we have, at least for the subsample, both the incentivized and non-incentivized measure. Yeah? And for the whole sample, we have the non-incentivized measure. And we have lots of outcomes. And we have a representative sample of the Dutch population. So this, first of all, because this is a, is a gender workshop, um, so the paper is actually not very much fake focused on gender. So we mentioned gender differences, but we're more interested in, like, is willingness to compete a trait that predicts outcomes, right? But just to show you that these typical differences we find in the lab, we also find them in this, in this representative population. So on, on the left here, you see for the subsample that did the incentivized choice experiment, um, there is a significant gender difference in the choices. It's not quite as big as we often find in the lab for, um, for students, but it, it's, still, it's still significant. Um, so both, say, you know, statistically, but also economically. And then in the middle and on the right, you see answers to, the, um, to, this, um, to this unincentivized survey measure, right? So what you see here is a fraction of men and women who, uh, uh, who are rate themselves selves as above median competitive, right? And you see that men are more likely to do so than women. And then here on the right, you kind of see the full distribution, the full histogram across the, across the genders. And it's especially in the group that says that, that they think of themselves as extremely competitive, right? So that then you have much more men in this group than women. Whereas if you then go kind of to the left-hand side to people who consider themselves not competitive at all, you have, m m you have many more women than men, right? So it's kind of these differences, is not, we don't only find it in the incentivized choice, but we also find it in this kind of self-rated self -rated measure. Right. So what I'm going to show you here is how what people chose in the, in the experiment, in the incentivized experiment, so this is for the subsample who did the incentivized experiment, how their choice correlates with, uh, so I'm going to concentrate here on two outcomes because of time limitations. I'm first going to show you here um, how it correlates with how much money they earn, and then I'm going to show you how it correlates with the position, the type of professional position they have, in particular whether they are managers or have some other high-level position. So what you see here is um, I divided um, the population of men on the left and women on the right, the sample population, into income quintiles. And then I, I check for those who chose competition in the experiment and for those who chose the piece rate, individual payment in the experiment, what's the proportion of each of these groups that's in each income quintile? Right? So it's a histogram. So what you see here is that um, on the left for men, for those who chose competition, they're much more likely than those who didn't choose competition to be in the highest income quintile. Yeah? And they're much less likely to be in the lowest income quintile. And we find the same for, for women. So those who picked competition in the experiment, they earn much more money on average than those who didn't. Right? And this is, this is raw data. This is controlling for absolutely nothing. So of course it's interesting um, to see, so okay, what happens if we control for age, if we control for education level, if we control for how well they actually did in the experiment, right? which I call score here, what happens is that even if we control for these things, people who chose to compete in the experiment, and this is now uh, men and women mixed while controlling for gender, they earn 280 euros more per month. Right? So this is a massive difference uh, compared to the 
average monthly income in a sample of 2,450 euros. Mm -hmm. Then we can ask, so what if we control for, for personality traits and for confidence and risk seeking? So that's on the right. What you see is that actually it doesn't matter. So it's not to say that these things don't matter for income. It's just they do matter, and I'll show you this later. It's just that that doesn't explain the correlation between these other personality traits and income. It doesn't explain the correlation between willingness to compete and uh, the choice in the experiment and income. Yeah? Yes? Like not willingness to compete here is specifically willingness to compete for monetary gain. Mm -hmm. And so you could assume that uh, that would depend on how much the individual cares about monetary mm -hmm. gain. And so in a way you show that people that care about money earn more money. That's partially true. So I'll show you the results in a second for the non-incentivized question where that's not the case and, and, and it's exactly the same. But but true, right? So it's it's about competing for money. So it could be that, uh, and in, in, in general, right, so I'm also not making any claims for causality here. It's also very possible that being in some kind of competitive career that gives you a lot of money also makes you more willing to compete, right? So to show that, so we find correlations, right, and even controlling for things that people are interested in, right, in, 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 in this representative sample, we find very strong correlations. Right? So we can also look at what kind of job people have because one thing that, that like you know one mechanism that people generally have in mind is that if I'm if I'm if I love to compete I'm probably going to move up the corporate hierarchy faster right or at least I'm going I'm going to try to move up to a, to a larger extent um, so they have this in this panel they have this classification of different jobs I think the categories that are interesting is high salary so that's the people in upper management and high academic independence. So these are people in other prestigious jobs like uh, professors, uh, lawyers, architects, doctors, and, and, and so on, right? So again, we see that these people are much more likely to compete than, than, um, than, than people in, like, for example, uh, manual occupation or, or people in clerical type of uh, uh, jobs. Yeah? Again, this is controlling for nothing, but what we find is that also if we control for education level, gender, age, score, uh, personality traits, risk preferences, confidence, and so on, right, it's still a very strong uh, uh, correlation between the likelihood of being in, in one of these two high-level categories and your choice in the experiment. So we also find, uh, so this is everything I showed you now is conditional education, right? We also find that people who compete in the experiment are much more highly educated. Or the other way around, right? People who are more highly educated are much more likely to compete in the, uh, in the experiment. Um, and then within people who are highly educated, of, who go to college, um, people who are willing, who compete in the experiment, they're more likely to have graduated from uh, majors that lead to high income. So things like medicine and STEM, and they're less likely to have graduated from kind of low income majors, uh, you, uh, including humanities and nursing. <laughs> All right. So that's was step one, right? Um, so we have, we have shown, right, that in this, in this representative sample, um, the incentivized choice measure that people use is correlated with outcomes. So the second more interesting question, I think, is so does our um, non-incentivized measure predict the same outcomes? So step one, we can show that our non-incentivized measure is highly correlated with our incentivized measure, so that's nice, right? So if, if that was not the case, we would be worried. But we can actually also directly check whether our unincentivized measure predicts the same outcomes with, say, a similar predictive power compared to our incentivized measure. So whether it's a good replacement. Right? So what you see here on top is the graphs that you've already seen, where we compare people who compete in the incentivized experiment and people who don't compete. On the bottom, you s we do the same exercise, but comparing people who scored themselves high on the competitiveness scale to people who, who scored themselves low. Right? And we see that the, the pattern is exactly the same for the two. Yeah? And this is also the case if we run regressions with controls. And then we can do the same thing also for the um, professional position, where on the left you have the incentivized choice, on the right you just have this self-rated scale, and again, we, we see that the same outcomes right, are predicted in the same way by, by both of these measures. So then the last thing I want to show you is 
So we have this non-incentivized measure of willingness to compete and we have big literature that uses other traits, also usually using non-incentivized measures, so like you know big five uh, personality traits usually measured through questionnaires. Um, we have uh, Armin Falks and co-authors work on risk preferences and other traits that are measured in uh, unincentivized ways. So how predictive is willingness to compete compared to these other traits that people in this literature have generally been very interested in, right? And what we do, because all of these traits are measured on different scales, is we compare people who score in the top 30% of each trait to the people who score in the bottom 30% of each trait, and look and compare like how much more do the people earn in the top 30% of the trait compared to those in the, in the bottom 30%, right? And how does that differ between these different measures? So that's what you see here. Um, and then what you see here, really on the left, is competitiveness, is our willingness to compete measure. Then you have the five uh, big five traits, you have the dominant all risk-seeking question, and you have a measure of general confidence and, and a measure of self-esteem, right? So what you see is that, um, Competitiveness compares pretty well to all these other to all these other measures, right? So in a similar ballpark, for example, it also does better than something uh, than, than, for example, the risk-seeking measure that economists have been very interested in. So if I want to know how much somebody earns, right, I'm, I'm better off knowing how competitive they score themselves to be than how risk-seeking they think they are. But then I can also ask how much does it predict if I control for all the other traits, right? How much does each trait predict conditional on all the other traits? So you saw already this in, 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 the, in the regressions, right? But our willingness to compete measure, um, even if I control for all these other traits, it's a very valuable thing to know if I want to predict how much money somebody earns, right? And that is the same, so the same thing applies if I look at whether somebody's in a high level professional position, right? Where competitiveness is one of the strongest predictors and it still matters if I control for all the other traits, yeah? All right, some conclusions. Um, so there is this big literature in the lab on gender differences in willingness to compete that has aroused a lot of attention because people think that this is, is a potentially valuable partial explanation right, for, for differences we find between men and women in career choices that in general both you know, in the policy realm and in the research realm people have been very interested in. Um, we show in different projects that these differences, this just this difference in choices exists not only in the lab but also in some field settings that are very different in, in, the, in the in environment and incentives. We also show that this measure in the lab is likely a, a, a valuable measure of a important personality trait in the sense of that it does correlate with outcomes. In a, in a way that is similar to other, so it can be a similar strength as other measures that people have been very interested in, in the personality psychology literature or in the literature of what economists sometimes like to call non-cognitive skills, which is basically the same, it's just a different word, right? And, and finally, uh, we have this ongoing work, and I hope there will be a working paper soon, where we show that, okay, so it's maybe really annoying in some applications to run this incentivized choice experiment, but maybe we can actually also measure this uh, a, a more in a, in a kind of classic personality psychology way by just asking people a question and have them rate themselves and actually get a, a, a similar predictive power out of it and kind of measure the same measure the same uh, uh, measure the same trait. And I would like to emphasize that. So I, I emphasize gender a lot today because this is a gender workshop. I think the significance of this goes goes further than gender. Right, in the sense of that I just think it's interesting to find out why do people make different choices in their careers, right? Why do they end up in, in different uh, uh, places in the labor market? And this is, this is true, right? Independent of whether we're interested in gender differences. And I also think a lot of the methods used here, they can be applied not only for willingness to compete, but maybe for other traits and differences that we might be interested in. So finally also, like often people ask me for, you know, what, what, what is then the policy recommendation you may make out of this. So I think we can think of many things. I think the number one thing that we should think of is that as an organization who is hiring people, do I actually want to attract the most competitive people? Right? Is, that, is that actually a characteristic I'm interested in? And if I'm not particularly interested in it, then maybe it's a good idea to change the environment because by changing the environment, making it less competitive, maybe I have a win-win situation where at the same time I get maybe more competent people, 
but I also get actually a more diverse applicant pool, right? For example, I have maybe more women who are interested in, 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 my, in my organization than, than if I create this very competitive environment that maybe I don't even really want, but that I just create kind of out of habit or by the way I incentivize people. So um, just a little bonus uh, at the end. So competitiveness, being competitive makes you rich, but does it also make you happy? So we can also answer that question with our survey data. So if we correlate all these different traits with like how happy you rate yourself on a scale from 0 to 10, controlling for gender, age, and education, then you know it's, it's OK to be competitive. Competitive people are a little bit happier right, than non-competitive people. But it's, it's much better to be mentally stable or to have a high self-esteem. Right. All right, uh, thank you very much. Thank you.